All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm John Forty. I'm the Director of the Democracy Project of the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm here very quickly to introduce our, our excellent panel. Um, one, of course, I think this whole day is, is very timely to talk about uh, oversight, and there's really a lot of great work around a town on, on these issues. I know we're, we're talking with another Inspector General today, so I did want to mention uh, the good work that POGO has done in the last year, the good work that the Partnership of Public Service. I will also plug a, a report here. Uh, that, that we did as well this summer, uh, Oversight Matters, what's next for the Inspectors General with the 40-year anniversary of the uh, Inspectors General Act. We had a lot of, lot of good thinking about where to go in the future, so I hope we'll, we'll hear more about that today. I will note also that we have a, a kind of yearly deep dive on oversight where we have just launched another uh, commission looking at uh, the executive branch overseeing itself, looking particularly at the, the control agencies of of GAO, OPM, and OMB, and how they how they control aspects of, of the federal government. Uh, so I'm here really to introduce uh, our, our featured speaker and uh, his interlocutor. So our, our featured speaker is Robert Storch, the first presidentially appointed IG for NSA. Uh, and prior to joining NSA, certainly involved in this oversight and IG world, having served at the OIG of uh, DOJ as the senior counsel to the IG and then deputy IG. and chaired the Siggy's uh, Whistleblower Ombudsman Working Group, and then previously served as a prosecutor in the Northern District of New York. Uh, and, and he will be interviewed uh, by Julian Sanchez, senior fellow at Cato, who studies issues of technology, privacy, and civil liberties with a special focus on national security and intelligence surveillance. And prior to that, he was at Ars Technica, The Economist, and Reason Magazine. So I turn it over to you, Julian, to speak with Inspector General Storch. Thanks very much, and thank you for uh, uh Taking uh, some of your precious time to uh, uh, subject to the, uh, yourself to this uh, this <laughs> grilling, um, so I want to start uh, by uh, talking about your approach. I think the the first signal some of us had that um, you might be doing things differently from some of your uh, predecessors at NSA was when you released uh, a public version of your semi-annual report to Congress, which is something that had not previously been. Uh, public, though it was, um, I mean, from, from what's been published, I don't think there's anything there that would, anyone would imagine would endanger national security. I remember, in fact, the first time we met, um, I was with a group of other folks from civil society who would, uh, among other things, ask, well, so just how big is your office? And, and the response was, I have to make sure I can, that's a, you know, a number I can uh, divulge publicly, and uh, don't worry, it was something he was able to tell us uh, soon after, but... Um, you know, in an agency where the default is that even facts that might seem mundane are uh, by default secret, um, it looks like you've decided to take it in a different direction. Um, can you talk a little bit about what efforts you're making to make your work um, more transparent to the general public than it's previously been? Sure. Hello? Okay, so uh, absolutely, it's a great question. Thank you, first of all. Thank you for coming out, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, you know, I, the agenda looked fantastic. I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the whole day. It's really um, great to get people from different parts of sort of the oversight mosaic, or whatever the right term is, together um, to learn about how one another do things um, and to learn from one another. So um, with regard to the question, yeah, I, you know, transparency is incredibly important. Um, I think for IGs, it's um, really a sort of a core principle of what we do. Um, I, I've said in other places, you know, I work uh, now at the NSA, used to work at Justice. Those are uh, big agencies. Um, they spend lots of federal tax dollars. So I think the public, you know, does have uh, generally a right to know that the money's being spent wisely, that it's being spent, you know, properly. Uh, and the programs that it funds are being performed properly. So that's a key function of IGs. And it's important that people know as much as, as they, they can about that. And that's, I think, particularly true at a place like the NSA, as I've come to work there and gotten to know it just a little bit from, it's been 10 months since I came on board, um, because, you know, so much of what goes on at the NSA can't be disclosed publicly um, because the work won't be effective anymore if that happens. And they do perform really critical work in protecting our national security, right? So it's why I was honored to, uh, to go over there. Um, but because of that, because so much of the stuff can't be disclosed publicly, I think it really is critically important that uh, we be transparent where we can be so that the public knows at least that there is 
effective independent oversight going on, even though we can't disclose everything that we're looking at. So that's all a preamble to why we released the semi-annual report. Um, obviously, like every agency under the Inspector General Act, uh, my office has for a long time done these semi-annual reports that go first to the head of the agency and then to Congress, and they contain all sorts of information about our reviews, our investigations, and the like. And not surprisingly, the report at the NSA had always been very highly classified. We continue to produce a highly classified semi-annual report, but it also seemed to me that it was important to try to uh, create a um, an unclassified version that we could release publicly so that people you know, could know about that. We released it, uh, first of all, to oversight.gov, which I'm sure everyone in this room knows about. Um, and I understand my former boss uh, was here talking about it this morning, Michael Horowitz. Uh, wonderful, IG. And oversight.gov is really a great aggregator site. And if you haven't been on it, I really encourage you to go there. It's sort of one shop stop, one stop shopping. Uh, and uh, so we released there because we did not really have an independent website yet. Um, so, um, but we were working on that and now we actually have a, our own, we had sort of a page on the agency site, but now we have our own independent website, uh, oig.nsa.gov for those who are interested, where we again have a lot of information about our activities, about the nature of our different divisions, you know, the type of work we do, about whistleblowers, which as I think it was mentioned in the preamble, my work on that, I feel passionately about the importance of whistleblowers um, and making sure that they're appropriately protected and so a lot of information about that. So, so through both the semi-annual reports and um, the website, we've tried to advance transparency. And frankly, through meetings like the one you talked about, that was that was a great opportunity for me, uh, for folks who, who don't know, and I think there are a couple of people here uh, who were there as well. Um, we got together um, a group of folks from uh, sort of leading NGOs in the privacy and uh, civil liberties sphere. Um, and I was able to come over and meet at the offices of, of one of them and uh, really hear a lot. I mean, talk about what we're doing, but frankly, those are always opportunities for me to hear and learn from the community as well. You know, what are the concerns that people uh, feel um, are, you know, things that are worth the IG looking into. And so it's a very valuable give and take. And we did it with whistleblowers earlier. We did it with privacy advocates. It's something I hope to continue. So I think all that stuff sort of fits within that sort of transparency rubric, which um, which I, I hope is real because I really do think it's important that people like all of you in the room and people out there in the community know as much as they can about what their government is doing. And at least if they can't know everything, they know that somebody like my office is, does know everything and is looking into it, right? Is there any, I mean, so I know we've seen this sort of interesting uh, opening of the aperture in a way across the intelligence community since the uh, the Snowden disclosures uh, some five years ago. Um, the uh, IC in general now puts out an annual uh, transparency report, which has some uh, uh, information that was previously less available in a, in a concentrated form. Are there specific products uh, that you're looking at developing for public consumption uh, in addition to the uh, the semi-annual report to Congress? Yeah, it's a great question, and the answer is yes, we are. I mean, so so one of the things we're doing, and we've been putting in place procedures to do this go, going forward, is looking at our reports and reviews and seeing what we can make public. You know, um, I don't have any interest in putting out Swiss cheese. I know it drives people nuts to read all the redactions and everything else, um, but we were able with the semi-annual report, through a lot of hard work by a lot of great people that I'm fortunate to work with, able to put forward a product that I think, at least I hope, was readable and meaningful and gave people a good feel for sort of the scope of our work, if not every detail, a lot of it. Um, and so one of the things I want to do going forward is look at the reports and reviews we're doing and see where there are ones where we can issue a public version of a report or at least a summary, um, some something that will let people know what we're looking at. And there, there are going to be some that we can't do that with, and I think folks will understand the reasons for that. But I think a lot of it we can. Right, And so that's something we're working on right now and sort of something to look forward to in the future, I guess. And when we do that, we'll be posting it both on oversight.gov and, and on our website. As you mentioned whistleblowers, um, it seems sort of worth uh, raising sort of an elephant in the room, which is that there's uh, you know, an important uh, reliance, especially in uh, intelligence, where things tend to be siloed and, and secret, uh, on uh, people within the agencies to come forward. But you're uh, sort of taken over this role in a context where you had a predecessor who was um, essentially removed uh, after an independent panel found that he had himself retaliated against a whistleblower. That was later uh, reversed on appeal by the DOJ, but that's a, a data point creating uh, a certain amount of uncertainty, uh, you have to imagine, among the workforce. Uh, back in February, the Daily Beast reported on a, an ICIG study that had uh, 
as I recall, found that they looked at 190 cases where complaints about retaliation had been made, uh, and I believe that they found that there was one case out of those where um, essentially the, the uh, internal authorities had, had validated the claim of retaliation. Um, to, uh, uh, a situation where one might you know, imagine that the workforce has reason to wonder whether they are safe coming forward. Um, so how do you, in a sense, establish uh, an environment of trust against that backdrop? Yeah, um, so the, I, I, the word mantra gets overused, but I think it's fair to say at this point in my life, this is a mantra for me. Whistleblowers perform a valuable public service when they come forward, when they see something they think, think is wrong. They should never, ever, ever suffer reprisal for doing that. Um, that's where it all, frankly, begins and ends, and you can operate from that principle. So my view is that's particularly critical for IGs. Um, our offices just aren't big enough. You mentioned the story. Um, someone asked at this meeting how big we were, and I had been told at one point that the size of our office wasn't a public number. So I said, you know, I'm not sure I can tell you that. And they're like, well, we just, I just want to know because I want to file a FOIA. I said, well, look, you don't have to file a FOIA, right? Let me go back and check. If I can release it, I want to be transparent. I'll release it. So I went back and I checked, and it wasn't a classified number and so I said look I want to release that there's no reason that's not going to hurt anything there's nothing about that and so we let everybody know we have 97 billets for those who are interested so public number um, so the reality is that IG's offices just aren't big enough to know everything that's going on across all of the agencies um, that, and all the components and all the different and everything else right so we depend as IG's on the people in the front lines, the people who actually know, because they work there every day, what's going on in their offices. When they see something they think is wrong, we really do want them to come forward. It's great, it's good government, right, as this organization and so many others promote, but frankly, as IGs, we need them to do that so we have the information, so we know what's going on, right? So it's, um, and that's again, particularly important, as you mentioned, in the intelligence community, where so much of the information can't be out there in the public sphere, it's gonna be valuable, and it can actually do real damage to programs if it is out there in the public sphere, there's even more incentive to want people to report to people who are authorized you know, recipients. And the reason they're authorized is because they can actually do something to remedy whatever the situation is, right? So we, for all those reasons, it, I really want people within the agency affiliates to know they can come to my office if they see something they reasonably think is wrong. We'll take it seriously. We'll look into it. We may or may not find whatever it is they think is happening is actually happening. We all know many times you see things from your own perspective and you know you're part of the story, but you don't know everything. But by coming forward, they give us as an independent IG an opportunity to look into it. And of course, it's not just IGs. There are other authorized recipients as well, people in the chain of command. Oftentimes, they can fix things right away. Congress, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of folks that it's appropriate to make disclosures to. Um, but we want to encourage people to do that. So to get to your question, how do we do that? Well, I think we do it by giving people information so they're comfortable coming forward. So both in my time at Justice, and I mentioned Michael Horowitz, um, wonderful supporter of this at, at Justice and has continued that work. Um, and we set up this working group with all the um, IGs across the community. And then since I've been at the NSA, we've been doing everything we can to get out the word to people on what their rights are and what the protections are under the law so they can feel comfortable coming forward. So along those lines, I mentioned our website. We have a lot of information on that. Um, within the agency, there's an internal uh, intranet, and we have a lot of information on that as well about whistleblower rights and protections. Um, I created a, a new position called a whistleblower coordinator, which was not that creative. It was patterned on my old job at Justice as the ombuds, um, but um, somebody who people could go to. And we created an email address for that person. So, and there's a link on the website, both the high side and the public one. So if people want to ask questions, they can go to that person. That's not an intake person. That's not the one who's gonna do the actual investigation. That's somebody who's, whose job it is to make sure that people know their rights and know what protections are available. And that's someone who is an existing person. I didn't create another billet for, because we are all about economy, right? But, but any event, so I wanted people to have that. Um, I'm looking down here, I actually brought a prop. Um, I always bring these with me. I have one in my wallet. We created these little cards that we give out to people. We do a lot of briefings of new employees, uh, contractors, representatives, others. And it talks about, it says, we need you. And then there's talk about our office and talks about how whistleblowers are critical. That's where you come in. 
and the back says, we want to hear from you. And then it's got all sorts of contact information for them. So, you know, we've done this. We've put up posters. Uh, we've provided posters. The agencies put them up all around the enterprise. There are electronic billboards, as you might imagine. Uh, and they've put them up on that. And so we're trying to do everything we can to get the word out so people know what their rights are. And then the other thing we do is we prioritize the matters within the office. I, You know, the, all the literature that I've read on this, and I hadn't honestly thought about whistleblowers until I came to the OIG at Justice. And um, when we started up the program there, I did do some reading in the literature, and it all talks about this concept of institutional justice, right? That, and we all know this from real life, right? What people care about, they, they wanna see the right thing done, but they, they wanna be taken seriously. They wanna know that the process has heard them. We, as I say, may, they may be right, they may not be right. I don't know the answer. They're protected as long as they reasonably believe what they're reporting. And I want them to know that we're going to take it seriously. And when there's an allegation of reprisal, we definitely prioritize those. So as we had done at Justice, I've done the same thing at NSA. I personally review every report of investigation involving a reprisal allegation. Because I want to satisfy myself. I have great people. They do a wonderful job. But I want to satisfy, satisfy myself that we're doing everything we can do to make sure that those persons that person's rights and protections are honored. So, so those are all things you do. I don't want to uh, yeah. get sort of too deep in the weeds on this, but how do you? How do you? So you, you, there are three, I think, cases in the in the report to Congress you mentioned of, of reprisal allegations that you investigated, and uh, my recollection is that the conclusion was that, that um, whatever adverse action had happened in those cases was for other reasons. Um, how do you distinguish? I mean, I think part of the, one of the the reasons people are fearful is that uh, about coming forward is it is. Um, you know, not always easy to distinguish between a uh, uh, a reprisal and something that is uh, motivated by some objectively justifiable uh, factor. Uh, how do you how do you approach those cases? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. So um, basically, the way it works is the analysis is essentially a two part analysis. So our investigators first look to see what happened. Was there a disclosure of something that's protected under the law? Not everything is protected, but it's a really wide swath of stuff. So violation of law, rule, or regulation, really broad, right? Uh, gross mismanagement, gross waste of funds, abuse of authority, uh, uh, imminent danger to uh, human uh, life or safety. There are, there are a number of things that are protected. So first of all, we look to see, is it in one of those categories? We also look to see, was the disclosure made to one of those individuals that is a, you know, someone who's designated to receive disclosures? So that could be somebody in the chain of command, it could be an IG, it could be Congress, there are a number of different places you can go to make disclosures under the statute, and those disclosures are, are protected. So then, did the person suffer a personnel action? And that personnel action has to be after the disclosure. Sometimes, and I remember this from my time at Justice, people would say, hey, I suffered reprisal, I blew the whistle, but you'd find out that the action they're complaining about actually occurred before they blew the whistle. So that's not, that's not gonna be actionable. But in any event, if you find that somebody made a disclosure, made it to the right type of person or someone who's designated to receive it, and that there was a personnel action that followed, that sort of meets the first part of the test. I'm talking to people here, I see some who know this really well. Um, once you get through that part, then we look at the second part, which is really what you're getting at, is could the agency, and the agency's not really a party, but could the agency establish, and it's by a higher burden of proof, that the action would have happened anyway? So if someone's been reassigned or someone was marked down in their performance evaluation or whatever the action is they're complaining about, is there evidence that that would have happened anyway? So we do that through interviews. We look at documents. That's really important. One of the things that I always, I've spoken a lot to managers and supervisors about these issues. And one of the things I always say is it's really important to document personnel actions. It's important, first of all, you should, if you're, a, if you're a manager, and I've been a manager a long time, young as I am, in different offices, you know, I think you owe it to the people you supervise to give them honest appraisals, to talk to them about what they're doing well, and also what they're not doing well, and where they need to improve. It's really all too easy just to give everybody a great rating and move on to the next thing, right? There's no pain, there's no angst, there's nothing. That doesn't do them a service. You're not doing your job, frankly, in my view, and the government pays us to do our job, so you're not doing that. But also, if somebody later turns around and blows the whistle, when you look, we, we as investigators will look back at that record, there's nothing there that supports the explanation. And we saw this not infrequently um, in my time at Justice, where 
they would, someone would say, well, yeah, sure, we marked that person down. But they were really bad at that. They had a real problem in that area, and so that's why we marked them down. But then you go back and you look at the performance appraisals, and they got great ratings. And there's no email. There's no other documentation of counseling. There's nothing to support that. So as investigators, we're then going to have to look at the record that's presented. So we, we do it through interviews. We look at documents. And ultimately, we have to make an evidentiary call as to whether the evidence is sufficient, again, by this higher standard, for, to establish that the agency would have taken the action that was taken against the person anyway. If that's established, then the reprisal isn't isn't made out because that would mean that the agency would have done it even if they hadn't blown the whistle. So that's basically the framework in which we operate. You know, the thing on statistics, I think we had, I don't think, I know, because it's in our public report, we had substantiated one the year earlier. You know, the, the numbers at a, aren't so big. I'd be careful about drawing too many statistical, you know, judgments based upon a small number set. Um, and as we continue to release semi-annual reports every six months, you'll see how we're doing on this, because we are going to be transparent and we're going to report out what we're doing. Since you mentioned this sort of metrics, what what is your way of assessing whether it's working, whether the attempt to establish that sort of environment of trust is, is working. And on the one hand, it seems like you probably don't want to celebrate that there's a huge upsurge in complaints that uh, you might think if there are a few complaints, that's a sign that you're, you're doing quite well. Um, but maybe a sign that people are, are, uh, are not comfortable coming forward. What, what do you look at to sort of assess whether you've succeeded? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, it's tough, right? Because you don't know, particularly where we're engaged in this sort of concerted education campaign, if you will, um, whether the an increase in complaints means that there's more going on, whether people are just more aware of us, right? And so um, we do keep track of that stuff, and we report it out and all that sort of thing. Um, one of the things I look to, frankly, is our, our overall numbers in terms of how many people are contacting us, right, or people coming forward. And I think we are getting a positive response in that area. And one of the things I've done since I've come on board is I've gone out and spoken generally about the IG, but specifically about whistleblower rights and protections in meetings from the very head of the agency on down, but most importantly, I think, in town hall meetings across the enterprise, where I talk about this and talk about the priority our office gives it. And I think we see that people do feel more comfortable coming forward, and we can see that in terms of the numbers. Um, it, is, it is tough with limited data sets, though, and so you know, it's something we keep looking at. So one of the, the other sort of spe specific challenges facing an IG uh, and an intelligence agency that you have referenced is the problem of not just transparency vis-a-vis -vis the public, but uh, the opacity within the agency itself and siloing. There's a, a famous quote from former DNI Clapper in his uh, confirmation hearings that the only entity with uh, with visibility on all, all special access programs uh, is God, um, which is uh, this is unfortunately it's not not, not who's unfortunately not available for for consultation, um, as far as I know. Senate confirmation class. does not get you that. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> but uh, but so you know we've seen a, a number of instances where um, there are real compliance issues arising from uh, at least in part these sort of internal uh, internal walls. There were a number of cases involving um, uh, the the bulk collection of metadata under Section 215, where the court had imposed various restrictions and seemingly not out of malfeasance, but but simply lack of understanding between different technical teams and uh, and the lawyers who were reporting to the FISC, um, the, the system just wasn't operating according to the rules the FISC had imposed for uh, quite a long period. Um, and it was only sort of much later discovered uh, in a couple of different ways um, that, that um, the technical implementation did not reflect the rules the court had imposed. So it's a long wind up. But, oh, but how, as an IG, do you work to um, to sort of figure out what needs scrutiny when even the people sort of working on the front line may not understand in a sort of synoptic way um, what the problems are? Yeah, it's a fantastic question, and it's a frankly, it's a that's a challenge that all IGs face in one way or another. I think right, um, the NSA is a place that obviously is pretty. Techno technologically savvy and the sort of a real emphasis on that given the nature of its mission set. Um, but I think that's true across the community is you have to sort of try to figure out where are the 
greatest risks, right? Because you're always looking for risk because we, we all have limited resources. And frankly, I think we, we should, right? I mean, you want to have to make those decisions so you're prioritizing and spending the taxpayer's dollar that we're doing it in the most efficacious way that we can, right? So how do we determine that? One way we've just talked about is whistleblowers, right? I mean, those are people who are on the front lines, who see what's really going on and can bring forward information that we might or might not otherwise know about. We try to have good relations with the agency. One of the interesting things about the IG world, right? Right, is you try to, you, you kind of walk a fine line in a number of ways. One of them is you want to, you, you obviously have to be independent and be able to exercise that independence to call it exactly like we see it. And I've been very strict about that. And I think all IGs really uh, respect that religiously. But on the other hand, you want to have good enough relations with the agency that they're listening, first of all. Anyone have, all those of us who had kids, if you, you know, if you're too harsh, then they're not, they stop listening, right? And so you got to figure out how to balance that so they're listening, but also um, so that they're telling you about stuff. I've done a lot of outreach within the NSA um, to, people within the directorates to other you know leaders across the organization to encourage them to give me ideas in terms of things that they think from their perspective we should look at and frankly it's sort of a it started as kind of a slow little trickle i think getting people volunteering for IG reviews, or there are not a lot of them, but I've seen that increase in our time, and I'd, I'd like to take personal credit for it, but I think it's because they realize that we really mean it when we say what we're trying to do is improve the efficiency, the economy, the effectiveness of the agency's operations, and basically help them to achieve their mission better. Do things through our independent oversight that finds things that can help them do it. And one thing about the NSA, it's a very mission-driven place. I think justice was too, it was a different mission, but uh, the NSA is very mission-driven, and so I think when people realize that's what you're up to, it helps. Technology, you mentioned, is a huge challenge. And it's a challenge across the IG community. I think a place like the NSA, it's a particular challenge. Um, you know, you try to address that in a number of different ways, um, through recruiting, um, through training. We have a lot of people in my office who have very impressive technical backgrounds, have a lot of experience, and that's great. And they bring that to bear on a daily basis. Um, the reality is technology changes really rapidly, particularly at a place like the NSA. And it's a good thing it does change rapidly, right? Because the, the threats change. Um, but so you can't really rely upon historical information or ex historical knowledge either. And there we do a number of different things. One thing we do is we turn to the agency. And again, that's not inconsistent with our independence, I don't think, and that's true across the IG community. We can't be experts in everything at any, at any agency. That's not the role of the IG, right? We're hopefully good at spotting issues, at prioritizing risk, at going in and giving things an objective review. But in doing that, and again, you have to have the relationship that you can do this, you're actually engaging with the agency and you're talking to the subject matter experts about what you're finding. And what I've always found, and I, you know, I was a prosecutor a lot longer than I've been in the IG community, but it's been a number of years now, is there are people of good faith in the government who want to let you know about what they're concerned about. So in my time at Justice and my time at NSA, I haven't found that people are reluctant to come forward in that setting if, you, if you're engaging with them and they understand that you in good conscience are trying to get at the issues. They want to tell you about the problems, right? They want you to look into it. And so in terms of expertise, you actually turn to the agency for that sort of thing. Another thing you do is you go to groups like like this, and frankly, the, the group of privacy and civil liberties experts we met with, one of the things I said when we met there, and I, I believe it deeply, is there's a ton of expertise across the community, right? People on the Hill, people in these NGOs, who really are, have a ton of expertise in these areas, and we would be foolish not to avail ourselves of that. So I wanna hear from those folks what they're seeing, and that can lead us in different directions. So you look at that. Another thing we can do is you can, we can go out and hire experts, right? If, if I feel a review is significant enough and that I need to have expertise that my office doesn't have and I can't get otherwise for free, if you will, I can go out and, you know, I've got a budget. I can go out and it's not huge, but it's big enough to go out and hire somebody if I need to, to, to bring them in to provide that expertise. So you sort of massage all that stuff together and you know, you, you keep working at it. You keep reaching out, you keep trying to find out what's going on, and then you try to sort of cobble together the expertise you need to do to do something that's really impactful, something that, you know, advances the, the mission. And is, do you have ability to, to sort of pull people from a crime? Because I would imagine if you're looking at a particular program and trying to explain or, or determine whether there's uh, an issue that was uh, the result of some kind of, you know, culpable error, um, that the people already cleared for it 
who are technical experts are also probably the people who, um, you know, would have an interest in, in explaining that everything was fine, um, you know, if, if, if they had done something uh, culpable. I mean, do you have the ability to draw on expertise from sections within the agency that are not otherwise already cleared from for the, the thing you're investigating? Yeah, well, so again, you got to be careful about clearances, right? But we can talk to anybody within the agency. Our people can get clearances for anything they need to have clearance for. And if we had a situation where I needed to talk to somebody else and they needed a certain clearance, then I would make arrangements to do that. Another thing we can do in, in that regard is we can go to other OIGs, right? So there's the IC Forum, right? And uh, Michael Atkinson, who's the new ICIG, has really been working to reinvigorate that process and to increase collaboration across the forum. And one of the things that Michael and I have talked about is being able to share expertise across IGs within the intelligence community. So my folks might not have that expertise, but somebody at another one of the of the IG, say the NRO IG or whichever one you choose, might have that sort of background. So we can bring them in either through a joint review, we could second them to work with us, or just you know pick their brain and get their information. So there are a lot of things we can do to try to get it. It's not perfect. Um, but um, nothing is, and what, but what you want to do is make sure you have enough expertise to credibly be able to examine an issue and then make findings and recommendations that actually are credible and meaningful and impactful in helping the agency move forward. I suppose I should you know, talk not just about technical expertise, but it looks like you know, one of the things um, you address is complaints involving sexual harassment or other kinds of improper sexual conduct. Do you, do you look at whether you, you have sort of specialists in your department who are trained for that kind of investigation, and is the is the gender balance in that office uh, so such that you are, uh, I guess, I suppose, not always sending men to uh, to investigate men, for example. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. Um, are, we do have trained investigators. I don't, you know, in terms of whether they have specific training in that particular area, it would depend upon the investigator. Um, but we do have people who are, who are well trained, and we do have actually excellent gender balance in, in that regard. Um, I'd have to go through and count up the numbers, but it's it's pretty pretty even. And so, um, in that sense, we we are well positioned, and we we do take those sort of cases very you know very seriously. Also. One additional, and I, I, we have, I know, a, a, a room full of people who are uh, very knowledgeable about these issues, so I want to um, move to questions soon, because I'm sure you will have better questions than I do. But uh, I want to also raise sort of a, another form of, of potential opacity that's, uh, I think, uh, maybe a more recent challenge for an IG and an intelligence agency, which is the uh, increasing extent to which the intelligence work is happening somewhere outside the four walls of the agency, either because uh, contractors are doing it or because uh, there are programs that have an interface with uh, social media platforms or telecom companies. Um, there's, I, I know you won't be able to say anything specific about this invest, uh, possible investigation, but uh, we recently learned that there was a, a systematic issue with uh, the collection under the USA Freedom Act of, uh, of telephony records that had led to uh, significant overcollection. Uh, that resulted in a, a pretty broad purge of those records, uh, and the the somewhat limited public understanding we have of the origins of this are that it was uh, an error on the telecom side, although apparently several telecoms. Um, and so, assessing, I would imagine, uh, if you, if you were to look at that, assessing the adequacy of that explanation or the the relative fault. Um, would involve understanding not just what's going on inside NSA, but what's going on at those companies who, uh, I, I, think, I, I don't know if you have any sort of power to compel to talk to you. Um, how do you address oversight when so much of what you need to understand uh, these programs is happening somewhere outside Fort Meade? Yeah, no, that's a gr another great question. Um, so. You know, first of all, I suppose I should start with our jurisdiction, right? So under the Inspector General Act, as an IG, we have jurisdiction over the programs and operations of the NSA. Um, so we're, we're looking to make sure that those programs are being carried out properly, consistent with the law, civil rights, civil liberties, U.S. person privacy, all of that, right? And so in doing that, a lot of the information, even though it may come from an outside entity, let's say, 
to the extent it's relevant to those programs is going to be within the NSA. And so we obviously, under the Inspector General Act, and particularly um, with the amendment under the IG Empowerment Act, we have very clear access to any information in the possession of the agency. And honestly, in my time there, we've had no issues with that. People, people get that. We get whatever information we want. Um, if I think I need a briefing on something or some issue that's come up and I want to learn more about it, we ask for it, we get it. So that has not been an issue. But we, we are entitled to that. Even if they tried to make it an issue, the law is very clear that they can't, and we would make clear we got it. So, so we can get that information. We also can go out to other entities and we can get information. We can, uh, we can, if necessary, subpoena documents. We have the ability under the Inspector General Act to subpoena records. And so if we couldn't get records that we needed from outside, we have the ability to subpoena that. It's not always necessary to subpoena. Sometimes you can get them through other means. But sometimes you want to make sure you've gotten everything, right? And I think back to my life as a prosecutor. Sometimes you'd want to do a subpoena just to make sure you were confident that you had the whole universe, right? So we have that ability. We don't have the ability to compel people from outside the agency um, from who are employed privately, let's say, or whatever, to talk to our people. Um, that's something that, as folks here may know, um, and I think in Pogo's report they talk about this, is the subject of some interest on the Hill, testimonial subpoena authority. There are a couple of IGs that have it. I don't think they use it a ton. I'm not aware of any big problems from it. My own personal view, and this is just me speaking personally, is it would be good to expand that. Um, because I think there are admittedly somewhat limited, but there are situations where you would want to be able to compel. Um, and one that's sort of unrelated to what you're talking about, although it could be related, but generally is a broader issue, relates to whistleblower cases. As I think folks here in the room may know, um, under the FISA Amendments Reauthorization Act of 2017, which was signed by the President in 2018, um, that extended whistleblower protections um, in the intelligence community generally to employees of contractors, subcontractors, grantees, subgrantees, personal service contractors. So very important step forward. Great to see it. Very supportive of it. I think it's fantastic. Well, one of the things, and we saw this certainly in the more general community under the contractor whistleblower provisions in, in uh, Section 4712, is that we as an IG generally, again, with those exceptions, don't have the ability to compel somebody who works for a contractor, even in a reprisal case, to provide information to us um, about potential reprisal. So someone can be an employee of a contractor, can see something they think is wrong, can bring it forward, and get fired. And we now, uh, you know, as, as IGs under the, um, under the recent amendments, that is an actionable sort of thing that can be investigated, but we don't have the ability to compel those people in the other, you know, the, wherever to speak to us. So, so more broadly, I think that would be helpful. But going back to your question about, you know, specific information, a lot of it is resonant within the agency. And if not, we can subpoena documents, we can talk to people, and, and we get the information we need. And you've talked about doing whistleblower outreach within NSA, but and, you know, so technically uh, maybe the most famous person to go outside uh, the system to uh, with with a, with a complaint was uh, was a, a, technically an employee of Booz Allen. Um, do you have similar outreach with contractors and clients? Do they do they know they are able to contact you, and does that in fact happen? Yeah, so, so we have, um, as I mentioned, our public website. We have information on the website for employees of contractors, subcontractors, grantees. We have you know, references to the statute and other information that applies to them. And then we also, as I mentioned, we go to these programs that the NSA puts on, and we provide information at those, um, including these little cards that we hand out to people. So we do want those people to know they can come forward. Um, and the ICIG does stuff like that as well, I believe. And so I think the word is getting out there. Is there room for greater dissemination? Absolutely. But, but I, I agree with you. It's important, and we're certainly making efforts to do it. I, I could go on, but I, I, I want to tap the expertise we have in the room. Yeah. Um, do we have someone with a microphone who's able to uh, circulate? We do. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, just uh, throw up your hand, uh, and I will – I imagine it's not necessary at this point, but please do uh, – uh, make uh, your questions brief and have a kind of rising vocal inflection at the end that <laughs> signals to all of us that you are uh, not not uh, uh, making a speech. Uh, Sharon, or oh, let's start with with Tom since you've got the microphone already. Um, I'm Tom Devine. 
Excuse me, Tom Devine with the Government Accountability Project. And Rob, my questions are interrelated around the Insider Threat Program. Um, what's your assessment of how much of a chilling effect that's had on whistleblowers because they're afraid it'll be used as a vehicle to harass them? Um, and second is, what's your assessment of how real that concern is. How much has the insider threat program expanded beyond its valid um, purpose objectives and been used as a vehicle for retaliation? And third, what are you guys doing about it? <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for the questions, Tom. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it, I think it's incumbent upon everyone involved in the process to make clear the difference between whistleblowing and leaking, right? Um, and, um, you know, we certainly try to do that in our um, educational materials. I think it's really important that people understand that, right? What I want to see happen and what I think IGs want to see happen and what I think good government people want, should want to see happen, I want to speak for them, is that people, when they see something that they reasonably believe is wrong or questionable, that they come forward to people who can do something about it through appropriate channels so that that can be looked into and if appropriate corrective action can be taken. That's what all the whistleblower stuff is about. I believe passionately in the importance of that and the importance of protecting people who do that. Totally separate from that, in my view, totally separate is people who leak information, choose on themselves to go outside the system and to leak particularly classified information. That's a crime to do that. And in my prior life as a prosecutor, I, w I never did one of the I wouldn't have any problem prosecuting someone for doing that because that, that can do tremendous damage. So I think the, f the, the first and most important thing as IGs we can do, it may be most important, one of the important things we can do is to make absolutely clear in all these educational efforts and other stuff we're talking about, what we're talking about, right? We're talking about whistleblowing. Whistleblowing, in some circles, get, has gotten kind of a bad name, I think, right? Oh, whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are great. Whistleblowers are people who are doing the right thing by coming forward so that someone can look into it. It's totally separate, in my view, to take it upon yourself to leak classified information or other information, in the, and, and that can do serious damage. So, so to me, the first part is educational. The, the answer in terms of my assessment, you know, one of the things that IGs are really careful about, you know, is that we speak through our studies, right? Because we have a very rigorous process, and I know there's some IG people uh, here in the room, including some former colleagues from Justice, who, who can attest to this uh, as well as I. We work through a very rigorous process, and that's what makes our work authoritative. So. Honestly, I don't think it is a great thing for an IG to sort of get up in front of a room and start opining on things. Um, what we should be doing and what we do is we do studies, reviews, and then based upon those, we make findings and recommendations. So I don't have anything public in any findings or reviews that I can cite to you about that other than I can tell you that it's obviously a very important issue, the one that you raise, and something that we're cognizant of at, at the OIG. So in terms of future work we might do, we're going to be doing semi-annual reports. We're going to be making as much public as we can. And so I'd encourage folks to look at that. But, but it is really important that both exist, particularly in a place like the NSA, where there is a large body of work that is done by people who are really committed, I believe, to the mission of protecting our national security and doing it in a compliant and lawful way. And so we want to make sure that those people are able to do the job as well as they can do it. And then if there are people who choose to go outside the system and to engage in improper conduct, you know, that's dealt with appropriately. Do you folks have any studies pending on um, whether the insider threat program is spilling over into counterproductive uh, consequences? Uh, in our, again, we report through the semi-annual report, so that's all I can, we have one that's public at this point, we'll have another one that's coming out, so, you know, that'll be the way we let people know what we've, what we're working on. And that has a section on an ongoing work, and, you know, folks can look there. So I, I don't want to, you know, it, it really is important, I think, as an IG, that we speak through our products and that we release stuff in that way. But, but certainly, you're absolutely right, I, there's no quarrel for me, that it's important 
that two things occur. One is that whistleblowers are protected, that they're encouraged to come forward, and that they don't suffer reprisal when they do so. And the second is that insider threats are appropriately investigated and dealt with. And those are completely separate things, in my view, and should be dealt with that way. Hi, Sharon Bradford Franklin with New America's Open Technology Institute. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank you for your efforts toward transparency, and I'm very glad to hear you saying you plan to continue and expand those. Yep. Uh, my question, I want to uh, try to ask you a little bit of a version of a question I had the opportunity to ask Michael Horowitz this morning, um, which has to do with the role of your office in measuring efficacy. And just for a little context, I previously had worked uh, at the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, and in the a report on the Section 215 program, the board found that that program was not effective and therefore not worth any you know intrusions on privacy and civil liberties. And in the board's uh, report on the Section 702 program, had made a recommendation recommendation that the intelligence agencies or any agency operating counterterrorism program take steps, eff efforts to measure efficacy as a normal course. Um, and this is hard, and the agencies reported back to the P-Club, you know, it's hard to come up with these metrics. It's hard to know in any particular counterterrorism investigation what was the key, you know, how effective a particular program was because there's so many different sources for information that lead to that success. But in this admittedly challenging effort to measure efficacy of a particular program, um, what role, if any, do you see for your office? Thank you very much. Um, it's a great question. Um, you know, we as IGs, our mission goes beyond ensuring that the law, rules, and regulations are followed. That's an important part of what we do, right? But it also, and you look back at the statute, we promote the economy, the efficiency, and the effectiveness of agency operations. So one of the things IGs, I think, across the community do is they look at programs. We don't set the goals, right? We don't set the policies. That's up to the agency, right? We're not management, as I always say. Um, but we do have a role in looking at programs to see if they are economically, efficiently, and effectively carrying out whatever it is that the agency has decided is its policy to try to do, right? And so, so the answer is yes, we do have a role. The question is the one you get back to, which is metrics. And one of the things I've found in the IG community, uh, in my time in it, is that the federal government doesn't always do such a great job on metrics. And so some of that, I think, honestly, and again, this is just my view, is that people are, are so busy, and we're all busy in life, actually doing whatever the mission is of their agency, that they're not always thinking about the need to keep records that enable you to assess economy, efficiency, effectiveness, right? But that's really important, right? I mean, the law requires it. There are all these statutes that require it. But it's really important for good government, right, to ensure that the programs are being carried out, that the taxpayers' dollars are being used effectively, that they're, we're being careful stewards of the taxpayer funds, all those sort of things, right? So it has to happen. And one of the things IGs can do is look at programs and look to see, are they being carried out effectively? Are they achieving the goals that the agency wants to be achieving? And if not, make recommendations. And many times those recommendations may include the agency is in keeping records or metric or information sufficient to enable it to assess whether it's achieving its goals. And so they need to go back and do that. And that's a if you look across IG studies, and I'm sure you have, you know, that's a pretty common finding and recommendation, that not just at any one agency, I think, across the community. So it, it, I think the answer is it absolutely is part of the IG's uh, mandate to look at those issues. It's something we are trying to look at at NSA OIG. And I think all IGs do. Um, and you know, it, it becomes important to ensure that there is sufficient data um, and metrics available to be able to, to do that. Actually, add a lanyard to her question, if I yeah. can, uh, because the other side of that is uh, sort of efficacy is hard to measure, but there are sort of civil liberties and privacy equities that are probably still harder to measure. Uh, the 215 program is a, a, an instance where at least the internal lawyers on the FISC had determined that uh, that collection was not contrary to statute. Um, you know, some debate about that, but that was their con internal conclusion. So you can say, well, you know, it's it's illegal. Um, uh, but when that became public, you had a lot of um, you know some of the authors of that statute saying, well, that's certainly not what we had intended, um, and a general sense that um, you know the effectiveness of it, which seems to have been 
particularly slender, whatever it was, was certainly not uh, substantial enough to justify uh, what seemed to be a, a very intrusive uh, type of collection uh, on, on people who were not expect, uh, suspected of any kind of wrongdoing. Um, that kind of equity doesn't seem like something that fits very well into uh, a kind of rigorous model, but um, you know, it's, it's hard to see what the what the alternatives for an IG office are, short of, as you say, opining, or, in a sense, kicking it out to the, uh, a broader audience and saying, you know, maybe this is something that that the public or Congress at least needs to to evaluate uh, sort of normatively. Yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting point. You know, we do have um, a intelligence oversight division. Um, I believe we're the only IG within the intelligence community that has a separate division that's devoted solely to intelligence oversight. I think that's perfectly appropriate, given the nature of the agency's work that we oversee. And so we look at these issues, right? And there, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer, I suppose, um, just to continue the answer to your question, to what the right metrics are for any given situation. Part of the art, if you will, is trying to find what the most meaningful metrics are, right? To try to reach findings and make recommendations that actually are impactful in ensuring that the agency is carrying out its functions properly and effectively, right? And so sometimes that may be something we can measure, sometimes it may not be. And it may be that it's appropriate in a given situation that we say that we can't measure that, but the agency needs to make steps, take steps to do that, including consultation with others or, or something to that effect. So there may well be situations like that. Um, I, I hate to deal in hypotheticals, but but having said that, sure, um, it, it just depends upon the situation. But the, the search for good, reliable metrics is an issue across the IG community, but it is something we struggle with on a daily basis and need to keep working at. Uh, I think we're, uh, this is an hour session, so I think we have time for one or perhaps two uh, questions if, uh, if they're brief. Uh, Jesslyn Raddick. Um, thank you for your remarks. Um, I applaud your remarks, but your office has a very dark history when it comes to whistleblowers. Um, I represent a number of people who did complain internally to your predecessors at NSAIG. And not only did the office fail to redress their problems, but they ended up referring them for criminal prosecution under the Espionage Act. So I'm wondering um, if you might consider apologizing to whistleblowers who did report through proper channels um, and then got prosecuted for espionage in terms of just building, if you want to build trust and good faith, with people who are still in these communities, how do you repair what was a very dark history? Yeah, I, I don't know anything about the details of, of what it is you're talking about, so I'm really not in a position to comment on it other than to tell you that we at the NSA OIG are committed to whistleblower rights and protections. We encourage people to come forward if they see something they think is wrong and they never should suffer reprisal for doing that. And if there are allegations that's occurred, we're going to take that really seriously. I can tell you that. That's the way we work, and that's the way we're going to work. In terms of what may have happened, I, I don't know enough to, to be able to comment on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, again, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not really in a position to comment on things that may have happened in the past. Um, I don't know if they happened or not, honestly. Um, what, I, what I can tell you, I don't. I mean, you can laugh, but I really don't know. Here's what I know, is we are committed to people being able to come forward and to provide information so that we can look into it to determine if something needs to be done. And that's what, that's what we're doing. Yes, ma'am. Squeeze in one more. I'm, I'm going to see if I can land between where Jess was going and where Rob's willing to go. Uh, my name's Danielle Bryan with the Project on Government Oversight. And and um, and this, in, in a way, also reflects the conversation we had this morning with uh, Michael Horowitz. On, on, he sort of argued that whether something was constitutional wasn't necessarily within his purview to make that decision. And in the case of, of most of the whistleblowers that came out of the NSA, you know, some of which uh, Jess is talking about, they were raising constitutional questions, specifically, you know, Fourth Amendment protections being violated by the NSA. So if future NSA whistleblowers come to you with what they see as a constitutional violation, 
Do you see that as your role to take that information and make those judgments and help them? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and I, and I hate to deal in hypotheticals, um, but as a general matter, um, we don't make constitutional calls, but certainly one of the categories of information that can be brought forward under whistleblower statutes are violations of law, rule, or regulations, and the Constitution is a law. So people who believe that they have seen violations of the law, they should bring that forward, and they shouldn't suffer reprisal for doing that. And I don't mean to be in any way evasive or confrontational. I don't opine on things that I don't know all the facts. I've heard a lot, I, sure, I'm familiar with the names. I've heard a lot of different things about what went on in the past. I'm, I don't know enough to be able to opine on them, okay? But what I can tell you is that I, in my office, we are committed to this, and we encourage people to come forward, and we'll take those allegations seriously. We'll look into them. We may not always agree with what the, what the result is that people think happens, but we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do it right. Is there a mechanism, so if someone comes to you and says, I think this program is in violation of the Fourth Amendment, and you know, the NSA general counsel says, no, I approved it, and I don't think that. Um, sorry, yes. Um, do you have a, what, is, what would the mechanism, if someone says, I, there's a program I think violates the Fourth Amendment, the NSA general counsel says, well, I signed off on this, so obviously I don't think it violates the, uh, the Fourth Amendment or any other constitutional provision. Um, is there a, a step you would take after that? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm loath to engage in hypotheticals, but as a general matter, once something has been determined, uh, whether it's a violation of, whether it's Constitution or something else, then we as an IG, in terms of our investigation, aren't really going to likely have anywhere else we can we can go with it, right? So, so the, the, general, the NSA general counsel's determination would be sort of the... The final word is well. Again, again, I'm I'm reluctant to do it as a hypothetical thing because I need to know more about the specific allegations to know whether that was dispositive or not. What I'm saying is, once there is a sort of dispositive answer as to the legal question, then you know we we would not really, as the IG, be the ones to second guess that determination. But what might be dispositive in an individual case may may vary tremendously depending upon what the issue is.